Welcome back to Aspire, GFN's first annual High Holiday Gathering. Again, my name is Tamar Friedman, and I'm excited to introduce our next piece of, of the program, which is a fireside chat between Rabbi Shai Held of Hadar and Andre Spiconi of JFN. They will reflect on the future of Jewish communal life and the spiritual transformation that comes after crisis. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Andres Spiconi, the president and CEO of JFN, to frame the session further and introduce his fellow panelists. So first of all, it's uh, Rabbi Tamar is a, is a tough act to follow. Uh, and, um, and this is, um, but, but I think she set the tone for the type of conversation we want to have, for the type of, um, of exchange, of, of tone that we want to have in this, in this conversation. The idea is that, you know, in this, in this pandemic, we in the philanthropic community have been talking a lot about you know, the, the, the programmatic aspects, you know, how to pivot to Zoom, how to sustain organizations, how to, you know, how to save summer camps and JCCs. And, and those are all very important conversations. We, we, yesterday we had our hundreds webinars. So we really put a lot of effort into discussing those important issues. But we felt that coming into the spirit of the high holidays, which is a spirit of reflection and introspection and, and spiritual renewal, we want to talk a little bit about not just the technical aspects of the pandemic, not just about how do we save our important institutions, but really about what's happening to us as, as a community, as individuals, as Jews in this, in this pandemic. And um, what's happening to us with the quest for meaning, our, our world is experiencing, as Rabbi Tamara was telling us, a, 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 a brush with death. I mean, seven billion people, you know, are experiencing the same fear of death simultaneously, and that doesn't leave you um, unchanged, right? Uh, so we we are all having this moment of existential fragility, and I, I for one, think that we are going to have a spiritual reckoning out of this foundation as funders and as communal leaders, we need to think about what's going to happen in that field as well. So to discuss these important issues, uh, we are honored to have um, Shai Held from uh, Hadar. Uh, you're Shai, you're the Rosh Yeshiva there, right? I'm the Dean. The Dean. E Ethan sorry. Tucker is the Rosh Yeshiva and I'm the Dean, if we're being technical. Um, um, great. So. It's uh, one, Shai is one of the, um, I would say one of the clearest minds in terms of what is happening to Judaism and to Jewish spiritual dimensions in the, in the 21st century. And the idea for this conversation is really to have, a, as Tamar said, a fireside chat, like two, two concerned Jews talking about what the future may bring. Uh, not in terms, again, not in terms of organizational structure, not in terms of funding, but in terms of spiritual and, and meaning uh, dimensions of, of Judaism. So do, do, you, do you agree with me, Shai, that COVID is going to produce a spiritual renewal, a spiritual reckoning of some sort? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Andres, for having me, and thank you to JFN and to all of you. So I think that my most honest answer is that I have a slightly different response now than I would have had if we had been talking six weeks ago. I am totally convinced that COVID ought to have a certain kind of impact on the Jewish community, that it ought to lead us to have certain kind of conversations and certain kinds of reckonings. I am less sure than I was six weeks ago that it will happen, certainly societally. I think there's really two conversations we could have, right? One is about the reckoning within the Jewish community, is one, and the other is about the reckonings in American society. I'm much less confident about the latter than I was six weeks ago. I'm more hopeful about the former, about reckonings within the Jewish community. So, but are we, you know, here's, here's what bothers me, or what worries me, you know, and I, and we talked about it a lot. Um, in the, after every pandemic, there is enormous spiritual change. Like after the Black Death, the Renaissance came. After 
you know, in Asia uh, adopted Buddhism after a smallpox epidemic in the seventh century. Um, there is going to be a lot of existential questions. And I fear that our community is not really dealing with those. I mean, again, we're dealing with technical issues, but are we ready for a big, you know, people asking difficult questions about God, about the hum human nature, about spiritual quests, etc. Well, I think if I were to answer that question in a blunt, but not necessarily all that gentle way, I think what I might say is that I often fear that the people whose learning is deep enough don't want to have those conversations, and the people who want to have those conversations don't have a deep enough learning. In other words, we can have those conversations, but if we want to really ground those conversations in the depths of the Jewish tradition, in Jewish sources, in moving beyond kind of cliched applications of the Jewish tradition, we have a lot of work to do. Frankly, we have to invest in having the kinds of leaders, spiritual leaders, who are capable of guiding those conversations. I do think it is true. I, I, I will tell you that um, just talking to people in courses and lectures on Zoom, the hunger is palpable. People want to talk about real things. I think that that's been true to a greater extent since Trump was elected, but all the more so, honestly, since COVID. People want to talk about why am I here? What can I still do with the time that I have here? One of the, one of the topics I think is really important to people and that I think has major ethical implications is what are the implications of how vulnerable I've been reminded that I am? Right? And vulnerability, I would say, is a bit of a double-edged sword. Vulnerability can lead us to kind of shut ourselves in, close ranks around only those we already care about, or vulnerability can actually be a path to a kind of broader human solidarity. I, I, I would say that to me, one of the central ethical and you could say even political questions of our time is what are we going to choose to learn from our, our brush with this reminder of vulnerability? Are we going to allow it to teach us a broader sense of solidarity to restore some of the social bonds that have been so frayed in our society? Or is it going to cause us to close off even more fiercely than we already are in our society? Um, and the evidence, I think there's evidence in both directions, frankly. And you mentioned something really interesting is that we, we're not equipped to have those conversations. You know, I think that um, the... You know, I, I feel that, f first of all, that these conversations are long overdue even before COVID. Like, we, we don't have an updated theological and philosophical framework. We still use the same ideologies that are product of the 19th century. In other words, if you look at the Jewish world today, uh, the, the, the denominations that we have, the ideologies that we have, you know, reform, conservative, orthodoxy, they're all products of the 19th century. And we don't, we haven't been creative enough in creating new ideologies and new theologies. And now on top of that, we have COVID sort of, we, we needed an update. We needed a, you know, before COVID and this makes it very, very urgent, I think. Right. Well, you know, w one of my favorite phrases in the Jewish tradition is a phrase that appears in the Zohar. Um, the phrase is dvarim atikin chadetin, old new things. We need old new things. That is to say, we need new formulations of old ideas. I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I don't love, honestly, the language of creating new theologies. I think it's about uncovering old ones in many ways. That's just my own way of relating to the tradition, which may be semantic and may not be, I'm not sure. Um, look, I think we live in a time and have for quite a while now, for at least a couple of generations, an atheological time in the Jewish community a time when the conversations about God are fairly superficial, if they're had at all. And we need to renew those. And if we don't want to call it conversations about God, we at least need to have conversations about what, what's ultimate. What are we for? We had the conversation about continuity. Now let's have the conversation about purpose. What are we in the world for? What are we as individuals in the world for? What are we as a community in the world for? What are we as a people in the world for? Those conversations strike me as deeply urgent, and I suspect, I might be wrong here, but I suspect that many of us get very nervous about that conversation because we're not sure we have answers that are satisfying even to us. Yeah, yeah. Why do, why do, you, think, why do you think we kind of avoid these conversations? 
Um, I mean, I think that part of it is we don't want to exclude people. So when you start talking about purpose, if you right. don't agree with the purpose, you're out. Right. So, but is there like, do we, do, are we afraid of having those conversations in Jewish organizations, among funders, among leaders? So, you know, it's, it's interesting, Andres, and I'm curious whether you would agree with this. One of the things that I've often thought about in my more kind of philosophical, theological hat is, you know, there was a time in the Jewish community when there emerged this conversation that got the label post-Holocaust theology. Post-Holocaust theology was not just a chronological label, but was also a label for a set of conversations. What do we mean when we say God in the face of mass genocide? You know, how can we talk about the God of the Bible in a world such as ours? And the conversation of post-Holocaust theology ended. And as I've gotten older, I've come to think that maybe the conversation ended not just because we moved on, but because the questions won. That is because more and more people in the community felt like they couldn't figure out what to say. And that's, I think, part of why you have so many um, passionate, spiritually passionate Jews who are passionate as Buddhists, because Buddhism provided a path that was a spirituality where they didn't have to, we didn't have to talk about God. Um, so I think part of the reason we're afraid is we're not sure we know what to say. Part of the reason is, I think, frankly, Jews haven't been conditioned to. I mean, I, I experience it all the time when I travel around the country and I try to get people to conversations about God. The biggest response I get is surprise. Oh, I didn't realize Jews did this. Right. So we've <laughs> almost conditioned the generation of Jews to think that we don't have those conversations. But then when they want to have the existential conversations about what matter most, my fear is that they feel like Judaism is not an address in which to have those conversations. Judaism right. is like a cultural weekend practice. But then when it comes to things that matter, well, I read Buddhist books or I, you know, read self-help books or I read Yuval Harari or whatever, you know, popular trendy book I might be reading. And I think that that's a tragedy. There is a way in which either Judaism has ways of addressing the existential questions that matter to us most as individuals and as communities or it doesn't. I think it does. We just have to be willing to have those conversations and to train the kinds of leaders who are capable of facilitating those conversations. That's a tall yeah, order, I, but it is doable. Yeah, and I think I, I agree with, with your with the diagnosis. I think that on the on the liberal side of things, you know, we're afraid of talking about God because you don't want to turn people off and the questioners, the people that may not have strong beliefs, that don't, they're agnostic, so you don't want to exclude them, so you don't talk about God. In orthodox circle, I think that there's the same reticence. I mean, I think that in some case, halacha replaces, you know, sort of an obsession with the minutiae of uh, halacha tends to replace uh, deep conversations about, about meaning, about why are we here, why do we exist? Right. Well, I think actually one of the things that one might say, you know, you referred to the denominations and, you know, their kind of almost vestigial power um, as 19th century German phenomenon. Um, I think that you could say in retrospect that each of the denominations found something to occupy the space that God had formerly held. So that in the reform movement, let's say it was ethical monotheism, social justice in America, however, that was interpreted in the orthodox world it was the discourse of halakha as a sort of closed conversation in the conservative movement in europe it was history in the conservative movement in america i think there's been an enormous struggle to figure out what that replacement should be which is one of the reasons why the movement has ideologically been flailing right is that it doesn't have a clear animating center a lot of the time um so i yes i think part of the problem is that all of those replacements at a certain point are exposed as just that, right? They are inadequate as replacements. They are crucial as adjuncts and as consequences of a more fundamental conversation, but they can't take the place of the more fundamental conversation. Right. On some level, look, you know what? I'll, I'll just speak autobiographically for a moment. I went to Yeshiva Day School all my life. I remember as a sophomore in college, waking up one morning feeling kind of depressed, adrift, didn't know what I wanted to major in, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. The usual kind of, you know, 20 year old angst. I remember thinking, you know, all of my years of learning have not at all given me the tools to ask the question, like, why am I here? How can it be that I spent all of my life in good Jewish schools, quote unquote, and I'm not equipped to have this conversation? What does Judaism have to say to me? And by the way, that's one of the things that helped launch me in my own career, which is that I, I, I kind of felt it's impossible 
that a tradition that is 3,000 years old does not have tools for this discussion. It is actually impossible. So let's start having them. And I think we're at a moment, we're, in, we're really at an inflection point in the Jewish community. Are we willing to rise to the occasion and have those conversations? I think for starters, we should have people like you saying what you're saying, which is let's have those conversations. Let's you know rein in our anxieties about having them and let's really have them. Let's talk yeah. Torah in the deepest sense. Let's, as, as uh, my, I have an, a, another autobiographical situation like that. In a moment of high perplexity, I went to my rabbi and I asked him about the book, The God of the Perplexed, right? From, the, from uh, Maimonides. And he said, oh, I haven't read it. I said, how come you're a rabbi? You haven't read the biggest book of Jewish philosophy. He says, well, he wrote it for the perplexed. I'm not perplexed. I don't have to read it. So, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think, I think there, is a, there is a fear of, of, of embracing our perplexities and say, you know, we don't have easy answers for them, but we have to, we have to right, go well, there. Well, we have to. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say one of the things that I, I, I often say, I imagine my students are tired of hearing me say it, is that I think religion at its best often gives us better language for our questions rather than pat answers. But you have to be right. willing to embrace that. Right? Yeah. You, there's a certain kind of, what I call it in Hebrew, hachala, capaciousness. You need to have a certain yeah. capaciousness, to cultivate a certain capaciousness, to be able to embrace the questions and embracing them as questions. Let me put it this way. Recognizing that you don't know all the answers doesn't mean that you're not deriving meaning from the questions. Right? I think just right. engaging the questions is inherently an uplifting undertaking. At least for most right. people. I don't want to speak too globally, but I think, you know, I think for most people, just engaging that conversation, really for young adults, I think, seeing that the community is invested in those questions would be a major step forward in their relationship to the Jewish community. Yeah, and for young adults to realize that the community is not afraid of asking those questions, out of wrestling with those questions in, in a very open and honest and vulnerable way can be can be much more much more attractive, I think, than a fancy party or, or a program, you know, of some sort. Like this deep engagement with with their own human vulnerabilities can be can be very can be very potent in that sense. But, well, but, just, but what I about you? Do you see it? Do you see? Um, you know, you work with Jewish funders. You work with Jewish yeah. nonprofits. Do you see? a burgeoning of a hunger for that discussion among that, you know, um, that dimension of the community. In other words, are, 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 are funders and nonprofits on board with the kind of revolution that you're seeking? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I would start saying that the, the zeitgeist, you know, the American spirit is not very conducive to that. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, 150 years ago said it. He says, that, I haven't seen a country in the world that is less inclined to philosophical matters than the United States. Right? We, we, as a, we as a country and we as a community lionize the entrepreneur, the creative, the, the person who, who sort of, you know, popularizes something that, that, that you know, has a great idea. We, we don't value socially you know, somebody that is an, uh, an, an intellectual and a spiritual seeker. We, we kind of value, but we don't really put him in the same pedestal yeah, right. as, as we put a Steve Jobs, you know, like, and if you think about it, all the big seekers of, 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 of sort of American Judaism were actually born in Europe. They were all, you know, the, from Martin Buber to Heschel to, you know, even Mordechai Kaplan, like there, there were, there were people like, I don't know where Mordechai Kaplan was born, but, uh, but, Mm -hmm. it, it, their, right. their intellectual universe was one in which other things were valued. So on the one hand, I am seeing the need, but, I'm, but I am seeing that we're not equipped to answer that need. I mean, I'm seeing it in my own kids. You know, they, they, my kids ask questions, you know, about, about that. Um, and, and, the, and the engagement paradigm that we offer is one in which we try to tone down those questions because we want to present a very low entry barrier to Jewish life. So we have that idea that if we ask those questions, people are going to be reticent, they're going to be afraid, so they don't want to come in. So this idea of lowering entry barriers but not asking difficult questions, I think it's failing us. Now, well, whether is there an appetite, but, but, but wait, is there an appetite to change that? 
Yes. Is there the tools and the elements and the culture to do it? I'm less confident. Right. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, to use, to use language that I, I often use with our staff at Hadar, you know, you can do advanced Jewish thought for beginners, right? As long as you Absolutely. trust people. As long as you Absolutely. trust people to have a heart and a mind that wants to engage, you don't need to talk. You know, I, I always say the first rule of adult education, never condescend to anyone. Never treat adults like they're seventh graders, right? That is exactly the wrong model. First of all, people smell it a mile away. Right. And, and at the end of the day, they don't respect you. And they, and they know you're not respecting them. But I think your question is really powerful, which is, so how do we cultivate a generation of leaders who will have those conversations, who are not afraid to have those conversations with their congregants, with their, you know, their students, their day school parents, their Hebrew school parents? How do we do that? Because I, I, and, I really think you're right on this. Go ahead. Yeah. No, and, and the question is, who, who are our funders and our leaders, right? Our funders are entrepreneurs and they're great. They're great at what they do. And that's why they, they became funders in the, in the first place. So the, the language in which they feel comfortable in is not a philosophical, theological language. It's a language of, of you know, entrepreneurship and a language of, of, of creating new products and new services, which is great. I'm not, you know, in a million years, I would be against that. What I'm saying is how do we add the other dimension? And, and I think that one of the barriers is because funders and leaders don't feel comfortable, feel, don't feel empowered to have those conversations. So they avoid it and they go to a, to a field in which they feel more comfortable, which is let's think about engagement ideas, you know, which is something in which I can be totally comfortable and I don't need a pre-existing knowledge. So how do we change that culture? That's, that's a tricky one and probably it starts with people like us sort of pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit and, and offering and proposing and, and asking for our leaders to, first of all, to learn more and to, Wait, and to yeah. confront these questions themselves, right? One of the ways that I might put that is it is always an illusion to think that better marketing can solve spiritual problems. Better marketing right. is never an answer to a genuine spiritual problem. Deeper substance is the answer, I think. Always, always, you know, respecting people, giving them language in which to ask the questions that they're asking, and even giving them language to ask the questions that they've been groping towards finding a way to ask but don't yet have. That's where the real work is, I think. Um, and but. It's very hard. I think also that I would say, especially in a context like this, you know, at the risk of being slightly provocative, I think part of the problem is that rabbis and educational leaders in our community often live with a tremendous amount of fear. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid of donors turning on them. There's a lot, there's, there's gotta be a way for people whom the community respects to be able to say what's on their mind without feeling like their job is on the line all the time. I think that that's right. a very complex reality that we have to find our way through. Right. And I would say, I would say, you know, one of my most disappointing conversations um, in, in Jewish communal life was when I met um, with a very thoughtful and smart uh, Jewish communal leader who's also a scholar and, and, and I said, okay, let's talk about these things. Let's talk about how do we add more content and more substance and more depth to Jewish life. And he says, well, no, let's talk about how can I raise more money because I need to, you know, make payroll this, this year. So I guess that, you know, many, one of the problems that we have is that many of our spiritual leaders, you know, are occupied, you know, not thinking, writing and teaching. They are mostly occupied maintaining organizations. So maybe one, one very concrete thing that funders can do is give those people the space to think, to, to, to teach, to, to write, to engage in those kind of things. I mean, probably you have it in, in your own shop, but I don't know if the people that are running, for example, the big rabbinical seminaries, the HSC, the, the, the JTS, if they have that freedom, like their main their main concern is their fundraisers. how do the 
they're fundraisers, right? So, right. And that, but, but that's something that as funders we can address. We can say, we can, we can tell people, you know what? You do what you're good at. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fund you to just do the kind of things that, that, you're, that you're best at. Think, write, teach, you know, discuss with other faith leaders. And, and we're gonna take that burden off of you. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be obviously a, gr a great bracha. I mean, the truth is, this is maybe a yeah. very painful way to put it, but it's not like we're so awash in substantive Jewish thinkers that we've been talking about funding 80 people tomorrow. We're talking right. about really like helping those people who have, I think both, both what to say and the language in which to say it to enable them to spend their time worrying about saying it rather than, you know, worrying about, where they're going to be able to afford health insurance. I mean, I think, look, right. COVID is a good example. A lot of people who ought to be spending their time thinking about the spiritual, ethical, political implications of COVID are spending their time trying to keep organizations afloat. I think one of the things, and, and I'm here out of my depth, so I'm probably the least qualified person on this call to say this, but I, 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 as, as, as a rabbi, I'll say it. I think one of the anxieties that I hear from a lot of my colleagues who run nonprofits is that when the economy goes south, donors often feel like, oh, I need to withdraw and sort of be more protective of my funds. Whereas in fact, when the economy goes south, that's when we need funders to step up more, not less, right? right. I mean, that's exactly the moment. The moment when people's endowments are falling apart is precisely when organizations that we really value, look, some organizations may go under and we'll say, okay, well, they, they, were, they didn't have a viable model. Maybe that's the case. But you know, it, it can't be that at a moment, that ought to be a moment of reckoning we're all thinking about making payroll rather than wait, how does COVID change the Jewish community? How does it change America? And how does it change the Jewish community in America? Those are the conversations we should have the space to be having right now. Do you, yeah, no, sorry. Go ahead, no. Do you, do you think that we, we could somehow, like it's not an either or proposition, right? On the one hand, so because on the one hand we're talking of, okay, there is a structure of community that produces engagement frameworks. You know the Hillel of the world, the Moshe houses, the the the, you know the birthrights. The you know those are engagement frameworks, and we're talking here about not about framework, but about the content, the 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 spirituality that goes inside those frameworks. Do you think we can marry the two? Do we think we can sort of imbue deep content in the things that we do already? So, do I think we can? Yes. Do I think that the path is self-evident? Definitely not. Meaning. We have trained a lot of professionals that engagement means fairly superficial stuff. Yeah. Um, I just on my Facebook feed was following a conversation among a group of parents of college kids talking about, and I, I, hope, I, don't, I, I hope I don't offend anyone here, but talking about how in their experience, Chabad engages kids with alcohol, right? It's not content. Um, so, do we have the ability to do it? Yes, but we would need to really reimagine what we mean by engagement. Engagement is not how many times is a person touched by a Jewish organization without any depth or substance attached to it. Engagement would have to mean, how do we get people to, and you can choose your language here, learn Torah, talk about ideas, you know, there's all kinds of different ways, depending on our own ideological predilections, how we can talk about that. But I think that we're invested. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We're invested in a model of engagement that is kind of stubbornly superficial for the most part, with exceptions. And we have to both allow our engagement professionals to engage deeper, but also to equip them. Because let's be honest, many young adults who are put on college campuses to be engagement associates don't have the Jewish learning to be able to do what you're talking about. Right? right. I mean, this goes back to one of my one of my pet fascinations, which is, you know, we did this as a community, this major thing called birthright Israel. And I've often felt that we ought to do this thing called birthright Judaism, where every young adult <laughs> is basically promised 10 days in a Beit Midrash of their choice. And let's have like, let's have a bunch of them. Let's have the reform movement create one at HUC. Let's have the conservative movement that wants to create one at JTS or at, you know, the American Jewish University. Let's have Adar, let's have Hartman, let's have the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. Let's have birthright Judaism, where every kid before they're 25 years old has experienced a substantive, grounded Judaic conversation. Is that going to make everyone a serious, passionate Jew? Of course not. But it's going to give them a better chance? Yes. And will it change the priorities of the Jewish community? I think undoubtedly so. 
Yeah, and and it's going to give also. I mean, but by the way, just for the record, I love that idea, and I know that some in in the audience have been thinking along those lines. And as I'm Jeff happy and, to meet with any or all of them to bounce around <laughs> ideas. I really mean it. I just uh, think it's so important. I was saying, I would, I was about to say exactly the same. If funders want to talk about this notion of a birthright Judaism. Uh, I think it would be as transformational as birthright was. I, I just think that- I think more, um, if I may. I actually think over a over hundred year period, more so. Yeah, be, be, because, because what, what, is, what, what is gonna get, like, what, what did birthright do? Like if you, we, let's push a little bit this analogy, right? What birthright did is it gave a common denominator to an entire generation of Jews. In other words, Everybody had the same formative experience. It is a life cycle event. Everybody went to Israel. Everybody know what Israel is. Israel is no more, no more sort of an, an entelechia out there, uh, an abstract idea. It's what they live through. So they can engage with it now differently because they, they've been there. They know. They share it with their friends. And an entire generation went through the same experience. Like we're talking about, I don't know, 600, 700,000 kids. Like everybody went through that. Now, if you were to give the same common language in terms of Judaism, you could facilitate a deeper engagement with that as, as well. I mean, I think- and going, Yeah, and, and going back to your, to, your, to, your, to your Chabad point, I mean, it's a generalization, of course. Of uh, course, and, and, and look, in, I, you know in, what? I, I, my kids are young, and when I was a Hillel rabbi, Chabad was not anywhere near as big as it is now. So I'm not speaking from experience. I'm just reporting on an impressionistic right, right, conversation right, 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 among but, but parents. Question. But the question, the question is not, how do you engage with? In other words, if you engage people by, by having fun, that's totally, that's totally okay with me. The question is, is there that gateway for the ones that, I mean, and if you want to stay at the level of, I just want to have social Judaism and have fun, that's fine. We don't have, in Jewish history, there never was a situation where 90% of the Jewish people were scholars, right? Like right. people were just going about their right. lives. But, but for those that want, our community should have a very seamless transition from a casual fun engagement, a low content engagement, whether it's through a Shabbat dinner, whether it's through a trip to Israel, to a more deeper engagement. And I think that we don't, that, that's where we also fail. We, we don't have that, that on-ramp to, to bigger and uh, to, to, to sort of deeper, deeper engagement. Yeah, I by mean, the way, as, I, as a I, community, I mean, there are individual programs, but as a community, we haven't invested the same in creating those own runs. I would also say, by the way, in, in my, my experience working with, with young adults now for the last 25 years, that um, one of the challenges that the liberal denominations in particularly, particular have is this, this almost reflex impulse to take young kids who are interested in the substantive Jewish conversations and shunt them all off to rabbinical school, right? <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a kid in a reform synagogue and you become passionate about Jewish observance or Jewish learning or Jewish ideas, you will be told very frequently, I mean, this is at least, I hear this all the time. Oh, have you thought about rabbinical school? But in, I mean, which is on one level great and on another level deeply problematic because what we actually need are lay communities of people who are engaged in substantive conversation. Right. So turning, I mean, my wife is an interesting example. Of this. My wife was a 16 year old who started going to her reform synagogue for shul every week and immediately was asked, what about rabbinical school? And she said, I just like Torah. I don't want to be a rabbi. But, you know, she was sort of self-possessed enough to understand that about herself. But that's, I'm, I'm smiling because that's the story of my life. I went into rabbinical school, not because I wanted to be a rabbi, but because I wanted to study. And that was the only, the only option I had, the only opportunity I, I had to, to engage that. But the problem is that even if you went to rabbinical school, you're going to teach, you're going to learn fundraising, right? You're not going to, uh, or I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, you're going to learn a lot of stuff, but, but, but. The no, focus but it is true, of Andrew, your training, the, the, what is going to be the focus of your training, right? No, but I think it's also true. I see this, I hear this from colleagues constantly. You know, rabbis serve synagogues where their own opportunity to study and grow are not all that valued, right? right. Well, what do you mean you have to go home and read? This is a job, <laughs> which I was like, yes, but yeah. reading is part of my job because you don't want to hear me give the same sermon 97 times a year. You want me to be having new ideas. You want me to be thinking. I mean, I've had rabbis tell me that when they come to Hadar for our rabbinic programs, 
the, the chair of their board will say to them, oh, that's vacation time, isn't it? They say, no, I'm not on vacation. I'm not on vacation. Don't you understand? Everything I do here is rooted in the time I spend learning Torah. But we're not, but if again, went, that's... But if you went to a management course at a university, they wouldn't consider it as vacation. Time. That's exactly it. Something that's valuable exactly for your it. job. Right. right. That's, and, and that is, you know, that's where we get into that very difficult issue of how do you kind of break into the cycle of superficiality. Right, right. right. Well, I, um, <laughs> this is like the virtual um, coffee that Shai and I wanted to have for a long time. And we're doing here in front of all of you. And this is, this is, uh, this is really, really interesting for me. And it's make me thinking it, it, it makes me think a lot about a lot of things. But I wanted to open it up for folks in the audience that wanted to ask questions or participate in some way. Um, and maybe by answering the question, we can actually continue our conversation. So there is, there is a question here from uh, folks in the, in the Harold Greenspoon Foundation that they say that in their materials, in their books, I mean, they work with early childhood, right? But in their books, there is a trend towards um, engaging with important questions and with transcendental questions. So the question, I guess, for you is, is there an age to start this uh, or this is a lifelong journey? Is it as valid as it is for PJ Library, as it is for Birthright and as it is for Wexner, uh, you know, it's it, is it a long, is it, is it, a, is there a critical age or is it a lifelong thing? I mean, how about if I say an answer to that question to me is yes. Is there a critical <laughs> age? Yes. And is it a lifelong thing? Also, yes. Look, I think that the early, chi early childhood thing is crucial. However, early childhood that is not continued into childhood will eventually fade from memory. You can instill right. certain values, which we should, in should instill. Look, I, I think. One of the challenges I would say, and I have you know great respect and, and affection for you know for 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 Harold and for and for Diane and for the staff of the of the foundation, a lot of gratitude to them. But I think one of the interesting challenges is how does one bring together the books that are really transformative for kids with real Judaic content? Like I think, for example, about how some of the most powerful books I've received from the PJ Library for my kids are books that are not explicitly Jewish where I end up doing the work of giving them the Jewish language. I mean, at the risk of going off into La La Land, Karma Wilson's book, um, Bear Feels Sick, one of the most beautiful evocations of Bikur Cholim. I wouldn't have known about that book without PJ Library. And yet the only mention of Bikur Cholim is on the flap that PJ Library puts into the book because the book was not written as, uh, you know, as a Jewish book. And I wonder whether we ought to be demanding of Jewish publishers better and more substantive Judaically rich books. Who is the Jewish Karma Wilson? Right. So, you know, I think right. you know, the Grinspoon Foundation has done extraordinary work. Um, I also know, I don't know enough about what they do and maybe Yafa can tell us a little bit, you know, as the Grinspoon Foundation begins to think more and more about how to engage the parents of the children and not just use the parents as a vehicle for engaging the children. That I think can amplify but the work of the Grinspoon Foundation you know, many, many fold. I'd like, I don't know as much about that. My, my colleague Ethan Tucker is on the foundation board, um, but I think, you know, that's the next, bi the next big frontier, right. I think, right? But, but I think, but I think to, but I, but I think that one of the points that, that for me is important, and I'm taking, with using PJ Library as an, as an, as an example. When my younger son was six years old, you know, prompted by, uh, PJ Lavery book, he asked me, why is God not talking to me? <laughs> you know, mm. I read about, right. I, I learn, in, I learn in, in, in school that God talks to this and God talks to that and God appears to this. And why is he not talking to me? I was just before, besides being an adorable moment, uh, you know, of parenthood, it's, it's, just, it's just, I'm saying, well, that's a deep theological question. So in a way, if you can ignite those questions at an early age and then have a system that can keep answering those questions in more age appropriate uh, right. uh, ways. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still asking the same question that my five-year-old asked, you know? hundred percent. 
where is 100%. God now? Like people are people are just dying because of a virus. So where is God now? Right? It's the same thing. Why is God not talking to me? But if you not, but if you didn't give yourself permission to ask those questions when you were young, I, you're probably not gonna have even the, the the language or the sensitivity to do it later. I think anyone who's worked with young children will tell you that young children are the most unabashedly philosophical people in the world. They really <laughs> ask question. They ask the questions that matter because they haven't been taught yet that, that that's not what we talk about here. I mean, the, some of the best questions I get asked that make me rethink stuff in my own work are from my own children who are the oldest of whom is 10. Um, I think that's another interesting question. I don't know how PJ Library, for example, would answer this. And we're really just using PJ here I want to, as an example. But, you know, my son, who's 10, loves to spend time reading nonfiction on his own. I don't really know what the, what the Jewish books to give him are besides texts. I don't even, I, right. I, I, and if I don't know that, I'm guessing a lot of other people out there don't know that either. You know, how do I get him to have re more regularly use Jewish language for thinking about what his obligations in the world are, right? right. I want my and son to think about Bikur Cholim, visiting the sick, Nichum Avelim, comforting mourners. I don't know. I mean, yes, he learns about those things in school and he learns about them with me, but I don't know what books to give him to read, really, as a 10-year-old. Yeah, yeah, no, and and yeah, and by by the by by the way, if if people want to send more questions, I mean, I'm I'm receiving a lot through the private chat, but if somebody wants to put questions in the in the chat or in the Q and A, please uh, feel free. And one one of the questions that I got is, are you seeing any model for adult education that is a good model of how to engage with these with these issues? I mean, we talked about PJ Library for early for early childhood. No, what's happening? What's happening with adults? Like, is there a model out there that could serve? If it's not doing it, could serve as a platform to to have these conversations. You know, I think it de it depends a little bit on how we define what these conversations are. I think there right. are programs that have worked incredibly hard to give adults more Judaic language and context for thinking about these questions. Melton, Wexner Heritage, you know, those kinds of programs. But those right. kind of programs, I, I don't know as much about Melton, but Wexner Heritage in many ways, it seems to me, program I've been honored to teach in, is in some ways preparatory for those conversations rather than about those conversations themselves. And I think programs right. like that are really, really important. Maya in Boston, I don't even know if Maya is still running, but Maya, which yeah. ran out of Hebrew College um, under David Starr's leadership, you know, was a great example of, preparing people to have some kind of elementary Jewish, I don't mean elementary in a pejorative way, but some kind of elemental is what I mean, kind of Jewish language for thinking about those questions. Look, I think that there are, you know, Pardes, Hadar, Hartman, in different ways, all do versions of this. But to be honest, the percentage of Jews that we together are reaching is minuscule compared to the conversations that we need to have. I think that some of us have created the models for those kinds of conversations. You know, right. I'm really proud of Hadar's executive seminar. I know Pardes runs a wonderful executive seminar. So what are we talking about between those two seminars? 250 people a year. It, it, right. You know, so we, 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 need, we need massively amping up scale. So, so models like the Melton School that try to do, that try to reach uh, critical mass, so models like Maya in Boston that are that sort of also trying to reach critical mass. It it goes back to the birthright, to the Judaism birthright that you were talking about, but for adults too, saying, you know, and then so that's one dimension, right? Like we can do the birthright Judaism for young people, but then we can do it for folks over forty. But then the other question that I that I get from from your words is that, and it's a question for funders and practitioners on the call is. People go to Wexner, people go to Hartman, to Hadar, to whatever they go, and they want more. Where's the on ramp to that? Like again, is it either rabbinical school or nothing? So maybe as a community, we need to we need to give some platform for ongoing engagement for these folks. Well, this is you know this kind of brings us back full circle because one of the things that I have been really struck by in my own work in the last few months is I did not, I, I declare my sins. I did not really realize 
how much hunger there is out there in the American Jewish community for organizations like Hadar to be providing opportunities for ongoing learning online. I totally right. missed that, right? So in March and April, I was giving a twice a week shiur in the book of Psalms with 175 people at every class and thinking to myself, who are these people, right? So one of the on is, first of all, these organizations can continue. I think it is clearly the case that once, God willing, you know, speedily may it be, this COVID nightmare is over, we're still going to go on doing a lot of the stuff that we're doing now. Obviously, we're going right. to bring back the centrality of human beings being with one another in person, in the flesh. But I think we've learned that there are things we can do. I mean, I'll tell you that one of the most moving letters I have gotten in the 14 years since we started Hadar was after our executive seminar online this year. I got a letter from a woman um, who writes to me that she is... Um, living in rural, rural Vermont. She has very, very, very debilitating chronic fatigue syndrome. She has dreamed of being able to participate in a week-long learning intensive. And only COVID has made it possible for her because she could lie in bed all week and listen to Shirim. This I, it almost brought me to tears. And it's, I thought to myself, like, how have we not done this for her before? Right. Um, right. You know, and it's because we not wrongly, I think, want people to be together. We know that learning in person is different. And yet, I think there's a lot that we can do. But about the on-ramp piece, another piece that I, th I think is important is that some of the people who end up at Hadar and Pardes for our adult learning are people who feel like they have graduated from what their synagogue offers. I hear right. this a lot from people, that synagogue adult ed is almost all beginner level. Um, and I think we have to, but by the way, there again, that requires us to, to enable rabbis to keep advancing in their own learning, to be growing such that they can be teaching at, a, at an advanced level. I think it also means perfectly, frankly, I don't mean to end on a bomb, but I think it means that we need to invest much more deeply existentially and financially in inreach and not just in outreach. It means that right. the people who already care enough to go to shul every Shabbat, but feel like they don't have anything stimulating them intellectually, know that the Jewish community is invested in their growth. I think people often right. don't feel that way. Um, right. they, feel they, like, feel, they feel penalized. You're, you're, you're already engaged, so we don't have to invest in you, right? right. Whereas, Right, exactly. But I, I, just on, this, on the same note, I, again, a, a friend of mine wrote on Facebook this week about how once he became a Chabad Chassid, he felt like Chabad was no longer as invested in educating him. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And you feel and, that as a conservative Jew, you feel that exactly, as... Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. That, that, that we have it all... Look, you know, that was my, part of... My, you know, Ellie and, and Ellie Confer and Ethan Tucker and, and my model in Hadar was, you know, what about all the people who are deeply in, but don't feel like they're being served? There are lots and lots right. of people talking and they're right about the Jews who aren't and in. They're, and, they're not, and they're not mutually exclusive because- to, On the to, contrary, they ought to be mutually to bring a, fructifying, right? They ought to be mutually right. beneficial. And, and to, you know, and, and to say, to, to also to end up in an optimistic note, you know, it's like, we, we have the capacity, COVID and all, we, we really have the capacity to do both as a philanthropic community, as, a, as, a, as, a, 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 as an ecosystem of organizations and leadership and people. We, we can do this. We, you know, the Jewish people did it when it had much less resources and much less, much less power and influence and comfort and security. And so if, if there is a moment for us to do this, to really invest at both levels, at the level of engagement on the one hand, and at the level of deep Jewish learning and dealing with these existential questions at the same time and creating the structure for both, this is the time that we're fortunate enough to live in the time that if we, if we use our resources wisely, we, we can. I, I just want to say just one, one last note about arts as a vehicle for that. This is a question that came from one of our Canvas funders, our program for arts and culture. Art can be an engagement tool for this, right? For, for to confront these questions for those that are not comfortable with a, with a theological language. They could be comfor comfortable with literature or with music or with, you know, things that bring them to the same place of, of thought and reflection. Yeah, I mean, I I'll tell you, you know, this is the things you get, the privilege you get in working in the world of Jewish education. I had in Hadar's Project Zug a couple of years ago, a group of Chiloni Israeli artists in Chedera, okay? These are not the sort of mainstream Jerusalem, you know, German colony yeah. folks, decide that they wanted to take a class and the way they wanted to process the class was by painting each psalm. Wow. Um, and 
I found this to be incredibly moving, both in terms of pushing my own horizons, but also in terms of just remembering that, you know, not every, not every Jew is a Beit Midrash Jew. And that's not just because we're not educated. That's not, that's not how all people process meaning. So by all means, like, you know, if, 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 if one of the strands of birthright Judaism is an artistic or musical track, you know, God bless them, let's do it. But let's just make it substantive. Shai, this was uh, stimulating for me. I hope it was as stimulating for me uh, in, uh, as, as, as stimulating that it was for me. I hope it was equally stimulating for the audience. I think Thank you. Yes. One, of the, one of the enormous privileges of my job is that I get to have this conversation with the smartest people around. And this is a, this is a case, in, this is a, a point in case. I just want to end up with, again, with thanks to, to you. Thanks again to, to, to Tamar. Um, yes, thank you, Tamar. And, and, with, um, and with an invitation to all of us to think about how we as a community of funders can invest more in deep transformational Jewish content and do the same miracles that we did in terms of engagement, do them also in terms of deep uh, content. So on to you, Tamar. Thank you so much. I really appreciate appreciate being able to be a fly on the wall of your, of your conversation. I hope that at another time when we're able to be in person that you'll invite me out to coffee. I would love to just hear you guys talk again about so many of these different issues. I want to wish you both um, a Shana Tova and a happy, healthy, sweet new year and I look forward to, to learning again to get, um, many times in the future. Thank you, Andres. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Shai Held.